Way hey, 30 likes already. <laughs> How are you folks? <laughs> we made it. Miracles do do happen. Do you know what? We nearly yeah. didn't. Oh, goodness yeah, gracious. it was a little Sorry bit about last week. Today. Yes. Explain, Rupert. Um, well, do you know, what? it's it, it is a, a side effect of living in the middle of rural absolutely nowhere. Uh, but last week every telephone service went down. We'd had a big storm and I think one of the antennae went down and and we had everything off for 2 days. Um which was all a bit scary. And then today, this afternoon, not even this morning, this afternoon, we got a message come through from the Mary, the town hall, uh, saying, uh, sorry, phone services are going down. You should have them back on this um, early evening. <laughs> Just think, oh, God. And uh, it was about five, six o'clock this afternoon that everything came back on except 4G. <laughs> and 4G is what I connect with to be able to do this. And how long ago did it come back on, Mike, when I called you and said it was back on? It was oh, not long, was hour and a half, after. something like yeah, that. Something like that. Um, anyway. Um, so uh, I, I, was, uh, I was all prepared to actually drive to the nearest main town where uh, reception was back on and, and actually do this off my phone. But um, hey-ho, right. didn't need to in the end. <laughs> if yes, you're new to the show... Person. That's a yeah, rather you, interesting Steve. introduction to it. Um, uh, but welcome if you've uh, not been with us before. However, I see uh, already in the chat that uh, uh, a great number of our friends from Patreon are already with us and uh, having a jolly time. Well, uh, it, yeah, and, but if you've never um, seen the show before, um, this bit of our output is when we're reviewing the film we made back in uh, 2000 well over from 2005 through to 2008 uh, and which took mm. off on YouTube uh, this time last year strangely enough um, which yeah. had us sort of uh, pull our socks up, socks up redouble our efforts and uh, put more stuff out on on YouTube. Um, so we decided a few weeks ago to review Standing With Stones through the power of YouTube and uh, other devices and uh, share our adventure with you. Um, this week we're into part five of Standing With Stones in which we uh, uh, visit uh, the Isle of Man and uh, the north of uh, England. So yes. I think I've done a pretty good job of uh, laying the groundwork there. Sterling anything, job, sterling Anything job. else we need to say before we uh, get on with the show? Before we get on with the show? Before uh, we get no. on with the Where'd show. Where do you live, Hallie? Um, <laughs> um, no, I don't think so. Um, yeah. I, I think we're ready to rock and roll, aren't we? Yeah. Oh, except that we're going to be making another Standing with Stones. We are and we will be bringing. Hmm? No, go on. Sorry, I thought you said something. I, I, I was just agreeing with you. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> it's this uh, slight <laughs> delay between Warwickshire and France. Hey ho! Uh, yeah, we are going to be making another standing with stones. How soon it'll be, I don't know. But you know, we've we've started. And uh, we're very excited yeah, we about have. that. Watch this space mm. for information about how you can help us uh, make Standing With Stones because uh, we, c we can't do it all alone. Um, um, this, Michael, can everybody see the spanner you gave me? Sibylla? I'm d distracted now completely. Oh, um, what, giving spanner the uh, authority to throw people off if they misbehave? Oh, yes, indeed. Mm. We'll see if uh, we'll 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 see if a wrench is necessary <laughs> later on. Um, yeah, um, I mean, immediately the first place you can go uh, if you're not already a, a, a patron on Patreon of ours, uh, that's the first place to go. Um, but we'll be announcing ways and means to uh, get on board with uh, Standing With Stones too in the next uh, few weeks. We That's, I think, what I wanted to say before we um, moved on to um, uh, starting the show. Anything else, Rupert? 
No, no. I mean, we're, we're, we can we can answer comments later on. Indeed Otherwise, we we'll can. never get started. <laughs> I know. I know. It's, it's mm. great. So many people, but uh, yes. it's, it's wonderful. Uh, mm -hmm. All right. Well, let's go. Let's uh, let's make our way uh, to the Isle of Man. Yes, Roll let's do VT. That. He said, "Part five. That's it." Halfway between Ireland and England, lying peacefully in the middle of the Irish Sea, is perhaps the best kept secret of the British Isles. Aside from being a beautiful island, the Isle of Man is steeped in history and folklore. To this day, it remains politically independent and is home to the oldest unbroken parliament in the world. The Tynwald was a meeting place for the clans and has had many reputed sites around the island throughout history. Even today, it maintains its ancient political rituals at Tynwald Hill, looking every bit a prehistoric mound in the town of St. John's. This deeply held respect for heritage means that ancient sites often add to the sense of place, accepted and protected in intimate proximity to modern houses. It's also home to some unique prehistoric sites which clearly show a shared culture with the British Isles, but are individual in their design and layout. On open moorlands, overlooking the sea, Across the hillsides and in secluded woods, the signs of ancient sites remain. Well, that's a little introduction to the Isle of Man, but before we proceed, I think um, we should explain, uh, if people don't already know, you know, that we both had a pre-existing relationship with the, uh, uh, with the Isle of Man. It... Um, it uh, it's a bit off, mostly, it's off most people's radar. And if they were making a, a film about uh, Stanley Smokes, they wouldn't necessarily make the effort to venture into the middle of the Irish Sea and include the Isle of Man. But seeing as I was born there and... I lived there. For a bit. Uh, it, uh, yeah, for a couple of years. Um, it was just... Uh, well, do you know what? I mean, it's some of the archaeology there is, well, you heard me just say it, you know, that mm. there's some unique archaeology on the island. And it would have been madness to leave it out. Some of the sites there are just fabulous. Mm -hmm. um, Martin's just uh, said he emailed me about 10 years ago regarding the uh, the quartz box. We'll get to the quartz box. Oh, Martin. my goodness. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. 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 Sure. yeah. talk uh, about that. Mm -hmm. uh, for sure, crack on. Um, where does the name Isle of Man come from? Uh, Sibylla asks. It comes from the god oh, Mananan. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, uh, who um, I don't know that much about, uh, but well, it's really it's Mananan. Mananan, uh, yes. Mananan. Uh, there was uh, there was a fight between a couple of giants, and right. uh, uh, and it was Mananan who I think it was Mananan who uh, he lobbed this uh, large lump of rock across the sea at the other one, and uh, and that's where it landed. <laughs> and so, that's what the island how... is. Mm. Uh, right. Oh, well, that explains a lot. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, Mananan's cloak. Did we have to? Oh, did you, know, did you notice that I've gone slightly Manx? <laughs> Mananan. <laughs> I've become um, the old man of the Manan's sea. Mananan's cloak. Yeah, uh, yeah. Well, it's it was one of those. Mananan's cloak is the clouds that uh, that cover uh, the peaks, um, mm. and it is often there. It is very often there. Uh, I once took a whole party of people up to the top of Snaefell, which is the tallest mountain on the island, uh, so they can get the fabulous views. They say you yeah. can see the five kingdoms. You can see England, Ireland, Scotland, Wales. Yeah. Yeah. Um, 
and uh, um, uh, and the kingdom of heaven is what they say. And uh, took them all up there, and you couldn't see a thing. It was just black <laughs> fog. <laughs> That's yeah. Manannan's cloak for you. <laughs> Graham says, I want a house with a monument out front. Yes. Isn't it funny how you know things like that sort of take uh, mm. for granted when you, you're wandering down a road on the island? Yeah. It doesn't seem out of place on the yeah. island somehow. Things it's, it, uh, it's so... It, saturated yeah. with uh, its past yeah. uh, it's uh, it oh, this is it. um it's uh, it's an extraordinary thing I, I the thing is i can't imagine having a prehistoric site in my garden and not holding the authorities to ransom i'd say you've got to come here and do this with me or i'm doing it on my own how could you not excavate something in your own garden just you um, know. yeah for sure um <laughs> Yeah, and of course, there's the Isle of Man TT. Um, I was born on the Isle of Man, mm -hmm. and uh, my fa family uh, lived there until I was six years old. So I uh, I grew up to the, in my formative years up to the age of six. You know, every summer the the TT, and of course, then it was the Nortons and the uh, well, it was the Nortons and the Nortons and the Triumphs, wasn't it? And uh, mm -hmm. everything else. And Jeff Duke was my hero. If was he? Yeah, you, you never hear the horror stories of the TT, do you? No, yeah. no. Well, you do. Well, hmm. uh, there's plenty of uh, stuff on uh, YouTube, actually, if you really <laughs> how it yeah. goes these days, and it's no less yeah. terrifying now than it was then. Sibylla's just mentioned the dolmen um, in Saumur that. Uh, in uh, further north in France, there's a uh, oh, yeah. there's a cafe uh, with a. <laughs> it's actually one of the biggest dolmens in France, in the whole of France, and the cafe is for sale. It's been for sale for something like fourteen years because they're asking <laughs> a stupid amount of money. Uh, they're, they're just not going to get that amount of money. Um, but yes, it would be nice, wouldn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, anyway, yes. So. The Isle of Man was known to us before, and uh, it was inevitable mm. that we would uh, pay a visit. Anyway, on to the meat and potatoes of uh, the Isle of Man. <laughs> <laughs> oh, this, yeah. These are among the first shots that we ever shot for Standing with Stones, with you. River. If you saw a hut circle yeah. marked on a yeah. map, we probably expect. wouldn't bother to even come and have a look. But without coming to explore, where on earth would you find a site like this? Listen, that's just. It's chuffs. marked as just a hut circle, which implies that it's just the footings of a building where somebody lived. But if it's true that this is how our ancestors built their houses, then why aren't there thousands of them all over the landscapes? You have to wonder, is it possible that it was where maybe a holy man lived on the outskirts of a village? Or, or maybe just somebody really antisocial who didn't want to have anything to do with anybody else? Over on the southwest tip of the island is an extraordinary site called Mull Hill. It's hard to imagine how this would have looked in its day, but the circle of cairns laid out in pairs with numerous entrances hints at elaborate rituals under an open sky and with clear views to the setting sun. Many of the island's monuments are positioned looking out to sea, and sometimes one thing need to mention you know from an archaeological point of view about Mail Hill is that we were just looking at the bare bones there we didn't really point out the fact that that's the remains of a cairn mm -hmm. and it wasn't it is not should not be viewed of a, as a stone circle but it should be viewed as a burial mound that's had all mm -hmm. its um, um, uh, it has been robbed and it had a central away. kissed yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and there are a few sites like that, I think, that we probably, um, um, you know, we looked at from an aesthetic point of view and didn't really do a deep dive on during the uh, the film. Mm. Uh, I mean, we've already been there on Dartmoor, but uh, Yellow, uh, Yellowmead, 
um, you know, that occurs now as a as a as a cairn with uh, an inner, you know, refetting stonework, not as a quadruple stone circle, but uh, as mm. we describe it so much. Yeah, interesting mm -hmm. yeah, things. We live and learn, do we not? Yeah, but Mail well, Hill's a fascinating well, site yeah. anyway, and yes. uh, the whole of the Manx Neolithic has got its own culture going. Um, uh, as Ronald, the airport on the Isle of Man is Ronald's Way Airport, and did you know there was a Ronald's Way culture mm, with its Ronald's own Way style pottery. of pottery yeah. and all that kind of thing? Yeah. yeah, yeah. Didn't have time to to mention that. We were just looking at the bling. <laughs> uh, we were just looking at the bling, totally. Yeah. Um, and it has to be said that uh, that back then we didn't know Tim Darvel. Um, oh, we yeah. only got to know him when the uh, when we were working on the book, and uh, of course, Tim is, he's done so much work on the Isle of Man, um, mm. and then uh, some more recent discoveries as well. As oh God, Mike, what's the name of the guy that we met uh, two years ago who's actually um, doing loads of work on the uh, Isle? Landscapes of the name. Dead. I'm sorry, I can't remember. For the moment. No, I don't remember yeah. his name. Um, but. Um, but you know, new discoveries that they've made. You know, new uh, fantastic Bronze Age site in the middle of the island that um, mm. uh, that they found a couple of years ago. Um, you know, with uh, with jet jewellery yeah. that came from that the jet came from Scarborough. Mm. Uh, stuff like that. Oh, it's just it's magical, absolutely yeah. magical. Anyway, yeah. mm. there, there'll, there'll be enough good material you know that we've learned since about the isle of man that will buy itself a very good place in standing the stones too i do believe in terms mm. of you know telling the whole story of of uh, the western seaboard and uh, the irish mm -hmm. sea and, and uh, you know who was doing what and when anyway i will resume mm. unimposing site can turn out to be quite special <laughs> here we go <laughs> of all the sites in the world that I've visited, this is one of my personal favourites. It's listed as just a cairn, but it's an excellent example of why we shouldn't take things for granted. And you can see on closer inspection why it can't just be a burial site. Have a look at this. This place is unique. It's a white quartz box. These walls and ceiling are huge blocks of white quartz. And the thing is that they're not at the center of the cairn, which is where a traditional burial would be. They're at the back. This place is intimate. It's really intimate. It is more than just a burial chamber. Another feature of this mound can also be seen across Britain and that's the small ditch and raised bank running around its perimeter. To me it seems likely that they shared the same function as the banks at the Great Henges, the perfect height for seating to watch a priest minister to his flock or whatever ritual was taking place on the mound. <laughs> Just stand there and do that, said Michael. You won't look silly. <laughs> <laughs> you'll only look silly if you think you look silly <laughs> buy into it you'll be fine um, <laughs> you weren't convinced were you no i'm still not i should have been singing <laughs> 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 then everything would have been all right <laughs> yeah. no uh, co dear. comment about um, claustrophobia it, there two comments about claustrophobia Really? Uh, being uh, in that never box, suffered from yeah. claustrophobia. Yes, no, uh, you just... Well, it's uh, all right for you. Go potholing. Uh, it's, uh, oh, it'll cure yes. all your problems. <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I tell you, I'm, I'm still... Uh, you know, the ditch and bank there, I, we, we don't pay enough attention to ditches and banks in those sorts of um, contexts. You know that uh, I mean it's uh, at the moment it's uh, uh, no stop it don't distract me. Um, at, <laughs> the, oh, I love the comments. <laughs> <laughs> Bad people. Um, I've inflated uh, trousers. But, <laughs> 
I still wear those trousers. I was wearing those trousers um, a long time before they were popular with, uh, oh, what was his name? Can't touch this. Um, it doesn't matter. Um, do, 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 do. That one. Yep. Uh, uh, but no, ditches and banks, stop it. That I, I said in that, you know, that the, the bank is at the right and height for sitting on. But that was a stupid comment to make, really, because the reality is that's 4,000 years of slumping and we've got no idea how deep the ditch was and how high the bank was at the time. And yeah. it's quite likely that it was just to keep animals out um, yeah. or, you know, whatever, that sort of thing anyway. But, but, yeah, MC Hammer, thank you. Mike Hammer, that. thank you. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> Yeah. Um, so, uh, and if you've not seen the blooper reel, uh, <laughs> yeah, that'll be we, watch party number eight. <laughs> oh, that was bad. Alone there, up on the hill, and a hole in the ground, and we just the giggling was just ridiculous. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Special memories, but let us move on. Uh huh. This is Castellinard, one of the most important sites on the whole of the Isle of Man. It's about 4,000 years old, and it's a great example of how our perceptions can become distorted and the impressions that we get can be a bit misleading. Oh, oh only 4,000 years old? Um, well, that was what my research told me at the time. Uh, have we updated that now? Uh, well, 4,000, that's... Um... 4,000 years old. That's a Bronze Age. Yeah. I mean, I don't, I mean, I'm kind of assuming that uh, if we were making it now, we'd give it a much earlier date. Uh, uh, yeah, if we were making it now, we'd say it was an Neolithic, but uh, yeah. uh, there, there, there is nothing in the film that I made up apart from, <laughs> ab apart from Yellow Mead being uh, like a target. Um, yes. And apart from uh, Paul Nebron being in. Um, uh, or what, being a diner? No, no, pulling the pulling the brone, being in the wrong. Oh, pull, so, pull, yeah, I was thinking of <laughs> Uh Yes, okay, I made that up. Um, and some Welsh names, old. maybe. Wow. Did you see? Um, I'm sorry, folks, if this sounds like we're going off on one, but uh, 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 Sean. Uh, left a comment on uh, on the site the other day with a whole load of tips on uh, Welsh pronunciation. Oh. Um, oh, honestly, that was just such a, a, a helpful comment to make. Um, bear with me. I'm looking to see if uh, if this dating is any different in here. Oh, I can see this is going to turn into some kind of meme or other running joke. Jones no, says, did you see that it's... Anthony Murphy discovered two log boats in, yeah. the, in the river? Yeah, what, Anthony, what, what, what is he like? Can't what, say if he was wearing inflated trousers, though. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, we're in awe of Anthony. Don't know how yeah. he finds enough hours in the day to... I'm sure he's a time lord, actually. I think he's a time lord. Um my book here says 2000 BC approximately. Wow. Uh, yeah. That's there you go. crazy. I don't, I don't think they know. Um, I think they're just saying that. But um, That's crazy late for a long barrow. Essentially a long barrow, isn't it? We'll have to dig deeper is, in that, see where that dating's coming from. It, it is essentially a long barrow, mm. except that it's, it's, it's almost like a, a, a homage to a long barrow. Because the configuration of the burials isn't long barrow at all, is it? Really? No. no. Um, Nevertheless, it's still yeah. late. I, I know. Gotta, it's, yeah. it's a mystery. It's a mystery. Let, it, let us carry on. Yes. We can be forgiven for thinking that you find somewhere like this in the landscape in an isolated place, and it would have been maybe a small community living somewhere. But when you think about it, the manpower necessary to create a site of this size must have been immense. When we're just left with the bare bones of a building, it can sometimes be very hard to imagine what it must have looked like when it was fully intact.
big, isn't it? Do you want to pause it there? Yeah. This is something you don't see. Uh, <laughs> this is something you don't see every day. Yeah, too <laughs> true. Um, Thank you, Chris. There's um, uh, There's been some uh, much more recent work done on Cachelinard, and there's a, a more recent reconstruction has been made. And uh, what they're thinking now is an even more strange arrangement of what the mound actually looked like uh, with yeah. a sort of cut-in forecourt down the side. Oh. Um, and uh, uh, in fact, I mean, when we were there, I don't know if you remember, Mike, when we were walking around it and I, uh, you know, and I was pontificating about, you know, why there were these stones here that, you know, because surely if that was a mound, that would just be covered up. But no, there's yeah. stones there that must be something. Uh, and they, they reckon it was actually uh, a sort of a cut-in recess along one side as well, which is, you know, I've never seen anything like that anywhere else at all. So yeah, it is a, it, don't it, know. It's, it's a unique and much more complicated mm. site than uh, we give it credit for, that's for sure. Mm. Okay, let's move on. You just hey. brought me some tracks. We're used to sites being isolated because the needs of communities change and they move to new ground. But you find a place like this and you can see that people have been living on this very spot for 5,000 years or more. Laxey isn't a big town. Even today its population is still only around 2,000 inhabitants. But nevertheless, its status as a successful settlement is clear. And this site is huge. It's probably one of the biggest of its kind in the whole of the British Isles. The other half of it is way behind the house on the other side of the road over there. This whole site is called King Ori's Grave in Laxey. And if it was one site when it was built, with this central row of burial chambers running right through to the other side, it's even bigger than at Castellinard that we were looking at before. So it must have been for a big community, and it must have been a very important site. Perhaps the important point to note from the Isle of Man is that even on a small island, we can see evidence of communities which were big enough and stable enough, either to have daily sustenance sufficiently under control that they had the time to build such sites, or that the community was big enough for some people to be dedicated to the task of building. So before we leave the Isle of Man, uh, yes, um, uh, Twig Hiker, is that I'm pronouncing that right? Would that uh, not be like Bella Snap in design then. Yeah, I, I guess a, a, a little bit, you know. I mean, I, know, I, I, I think mentioning the side additions. I think there's an important I point to, the question. To, to make here. Um, and also, Yoda's mom is on drugs. You've got to tell me what your name is. <laughs> <laughs> I'll um, trade those stones uh, for my neighbours. Yeah, yeah. quite a few people. Are we feel positive that, that those stones didn't line the walls and they were later moved to standing stones? Uh, yes, because um, mm. to have that sort of arrangement as a forecourt is uh, is not unusual. Um, yeah. uh, you know, there, there's uh, there's lots of places where you have a very imposing forecourt where you know you can imagine that the ceremony would have gone uh, on before the interment was uh, uh, was made um but in terms of you know similarities of uh, you know isn't it like bella snap yeah i i think it's important to bear in mind that you've got the individual foibles of people there, there is a there is a way of doing things and uh so you can have an, an overall you know a, so a long barrow is a style of burial but what you as an individual uh, group, village, settlement, whatever, what you decide to do with your particular one, you know, you, it might have been somebody who just fancied, you know, just making it a slightly different shape just because, you know, why the hell not? 
Uh, so I think that we're the, the trouble with us now, and Mike and I are talking about this all the time, that one of our biggest problems is we have we just have this obsession with categorizing everything. And and so if two things are a little bit different, we put them in different boxes. Well, no, they're the same thing. It's just the two people or groups of people who did this just had ever so slightly different ideas. Um, you know, it, it's like if you went into a cemetery now, would you think that there was something fundamentally different between a horizontal, you know, a lying flat slab or a standing up headstone? You know, would we think culturally that there must be a difference between the two burials? You know, was it, you know, somebody important was in this one and somebody less important was in that one? Well, no, it's just, it's just what we choose to do with our loved ones, you know. Yeah. So I, I think the, the categorization is a risky one, really. Yeah. But uh, four courts like that are pretty ubiquitous. Um, mm. they're, they're a really common feature. The earliest example we know is um, at um, uh, Grey... Um, Grey Cairns uh, of Camster? Grey Cairns of Camster, yeah. Um, mm. But, of course, uh, all of the Cotswold Seven tombs e exhibit that... Uh, that particular feature. So what was going on there? We will probably never know. Joan, will we be using drones for Standing with Stones too? Uh, almost certainly, but only if they help the narrative. You know, I'm, I'm, it's... Um, uh, <laughs> it would be so easy to become overrun, you know, because they're, they're an easy way of getting a nice shot, but uh, yeah. only, only when necessary. I think they 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 can easily hold up a thing. You can get beholden yeah. to to the drone shot and uh, the beauty shot. The, the, but if you've mm. got the right stuff, though, you can get beautiful shots still <laughs> while still being on on the ground. So only as uh, as necessary. But yeah, certainly. It depends where we go. There there are yeah. some places that if, you know won't be if able we to. do. No, exactly. If we do some of the overseas places that we're thinking about. Yeah. Then the you know You'd the thing is arrested. we don't want to end up in jail for yeah, twenty yeah. years, uh, so yeah. we'll see. But yeah, yeah. oh, it's, it's quite easy. It's quite easy to get you know prosecuted in this country for flying in your drone in the wrong way, in the wrong place, even if you've got a uh, a license to do so. So you've got to be careful. Uh, mm. Anyway, anything else in the uh, questions in the chat? Uh, I can't see. Uh, I think Joan uh, Joan McH <laughs> says I have a suitor in my garden in the west of Ireland. I'll not go down there ever. Wow. Okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> we must come and visit and have a look in your suitor. Uh, is is David with us tonight? Is David Potter with us this evening? Yes, he is. David, look there you go. Right. Somebody with a suitor. A suitor. A fogu by any other name. Yeah, there you go. Get on with it, folks. Right. <laughs> let's let's yeah. go to uh, Formby Point. Oh, wonderful. Love that place. Coming down the timeline of history, inevitably there are crossovers between archaeology and geology but it is important not to blur the edges. Archaeology tells us about how our ancestors lived, what they did, what they left behind, but geology tells us about the land on which they lived. In archaeological terms, what we broadly call the Stone Age began way back, two and a half million years ago, in the Paleolithic. And astonishingly, with this simple tool use, it was well over a million years before man realised that it was a good idea to hit stones with stones. The development was really slow. We have to come way, way down, closer to the present day, to the Neolithic period, which started incredibly only 8,000 years ago, when our building work began. That lasted until the beginning of the Bronze Age, only 4,500 years ago. Now all this sits within a geological period called the Holocene, which started 10,000 years ago. 
So all the work that we know of, all the ancient sites, all the megalithic tomb building, that all happened in this small time frame in the Holocene period. Now here, in the Holocene beds at Formby Point, north of Liverpool, something truly wonderful is happening. The sea here has washed away thousands of years of sand, uncovering a 6,000-year-old beach, baked so hard by the sun over a long dry period that when the tide next brought sands over to cover it, it just rested gently on top, protecting every mark that had been made by people. This isn't rock. This is just baked hard ancient sand. So the sea is gradually washing it away. These won't be here for long. They have found children's footprints and animals' footprints here too. So the man who left these prints could have been out hunting with his children. It's wonderful to think that he could have stood on this spot watching his children play or watching the sun go down. It's fantastic. Well, I seem to actually uh, make it appear as if we knew what we were doing on the beach there. <laughs> I'm just thinking, <laughs> how, how, the tide was coming in. And yeah, we you'd didn't already get broken right. a polarizing filter. <laughs> oh, I'd forgotten about that. Uh, and uh, we didn't get it right every time. So every time we're having to move on to find a fresh bit of sand so we could do the marks. If you look in some of the... If you look back along yeah. some of those shots, you can see previous efforts <laughs> stretching out yeah. back along. Uh, yeah. yeah, I just kept back on cooking up. Kept on ah, cooking up. He did. Um, uh, somebody asked, "Who was it?" Somebody said, uh, "Are they still there oh, now?" Yeah. Um, and uh, yes. Oh, it's Lynn. Um, uh, yes and no. Uh, they uh, the, the the waves just keep on uncovering new new tracks. Uh, so there are there are times when you just won't be able to find any, but you just you know wait a little while, you know, mm -hmm. some months, and go back, and they'll have un uh, the, the yeah. waves will have uncovered a new set. I mean, we weren't um, sure that we'd find any when we got there, you know, having made the effort to no. go up to Liverpool. And, and, Do you know what? It, film, it's so we funny how these things happen. I, I had read an article in a magazine years before, years before, and I had just kept the magazine. Um, and uh, and it was like, I don't know, that'll be useful one day. <laughs> it's yeah. just, it's funny the way things uh uh, you know, things turn out that they they mm. couldn't have been more relevant. You know, the fact that they are concurrent with mm. our, uh, you know, megalith building and stuff. It's uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, Jennifer. If magical. you do go up, uh, I I would I would you know take a chance and uh, and and go up there, Jennifer, and because uh, you're mm. quite adjacent, uh, aren't you? Because uh, yeah, you're just as likely to to find them. It, the thing to look out for, and I don't know if they still do this, but they put little coloured tags when um, enthusiasts and people that look after um, uh, the beach. It's a National Trust. Yeah, it's the Museum they, of Liverpool, I think. Yeah, as the Museum of Liverpool, mm. they do go out and, you know, as new ones are uh, emerge from under the sand, they they tag them, put little. Um, coloured uh, tags. Uh, on. They. Uh, uh, there's been a, an enormous amount of research, actually. If you uh, mm, if you actually yeah. Google uh, Formby footprints, um, then uh, there's a number of papers that have been uh, uh, written about them, and they very often they will go out and make casts of them. In fact, if you go to the Museum yeah. of Liverpool, they they have got casts of uh, loads of the footprints in there. Yeah. Um, yeah, completely magical, and uh, and one of the uh, one of the sets of footprints. In fact, you off? I have got it on my. No, no, no. I just <laughs> couldn't remember if it, if this was if it was on my desk. Um, but uh, in uh, in uh, in the book, uh, he he said, wondering if his video was actually going to catch up. Uh, uh, but um... <sighs> come on, Soskin. 
I have to say, uh, were you, were, are you going to show a pic with uh, Aurochs? <laughs> oh, no, that. The fact that, the, the fact that my foot was the same size. Yeah. <laughs> he could have worn my boots. But yeah. um, uh, though, uh, can you see that? The, uh, the, you can see the uh, crane. Footprints. Crane's footprints and and that inset the, the where is it there? That's an aurochs hoof print in the inset there. It's uh, I think Siri thinks I've asked him her a question. That's Siri, is it? Wow, that's misbehaving. Shut up. Um, <laughs> Um, I think one of the um, one of the most evocative things of all, you know, is uh, is walking along that beach. So if you go back in time, it wasn't actually uh, the uh, the coast opening out to the sea. It was brackish water on a delta that was going out to the sea. So this is where mm. a, a river yeah, delta yeah. was actually meeting the waves, and uh, so. There's uh, there's a wealth of uh, animal tracks and human prints. So there's there's red deer, roe deer. There's all sorts of different there's animals aurochs. there, and you can and aurochs. And you know, it's just, the thing is that you can uh, you can walk along that patch of mud, and okay, you can't say that they were all done on the same day. Depends what the tide was doing. We don't know. But the thing is that they were all put in the same soft layers of uh, of of mud, so they happened within days of each other. If they didn't happen on the same day, mm. so to to know that you were you know standing like when I could put my feet in those human footprints and know that that was a guy who yes he might have been out with his kids he might have been hunting animals he could it's just this it's completely frozen in time. It's, just awesome magical mm. Mm. Well, we were very lucky shall mm. i press that resume uh, um last video button then uh, before you do it? just replying to uh to uh genie there um oh yeah it's uh it's uh, it's actually an extraordinary thing on that stretch of coastline yeah. that uh, the geology shows that it is almost unchanged in that period of time. Now, you, you can go to so many other places. And in fact, the Isle of Man is a good example. You go to the northwest coast of the Isle of Man, and that is eroding away so quickly that uh, because of the strength of the currents, that even uh, well during World War II, there was an American air base um, up on uh, on. Jerby on the northwest, Jerby, yeah. <clears throat> and uh, and that the, the runway of the uh, of the airbase is now over a quarter of a mile out to sea. That's how much, you know. So it's actually it's about half a mile of coast has disappeared in mm. sixty years, um, and uh, and yet you have this patch of uh, of the north of England where nothing has changed particularly it's extraordinary well, it's kind of on the um, fulcrum of the glacial rebound isn't it that is true that is true and uh you know it so you, for some reason we there's this fortunate thing of having a stasis where you are almost locked in time there's a there's a few places like it there's a, there's a place in oh god where is it there's a place in the cotswold somewhere uh where uh, you can actually stand on a cliff face uh, that has not changed since the Jurassic. It's mm. just a bizarre freak of nature that um, uh, you can scrabble down in the dirt and pick up seashells <clears> on the top <throat> of a hill. You know, uh, it's just Lassie, Matt. You would have gotten away with it. Yeah, we, Matt. We, we, you could have. You could have been here all the time. You know, and we, <laughs> we would have thought. You know, <laughs> but no, you had to tell us. Anyway, you're welcome. <laughs> of course you are. <laughs> Great to yeah. see you. Yeah, uh, yeah that, that was about it. And I'm thinking it wouldn't have been seaside like that. I'm thinking it would be more like what the, the wash is today, like those sort of North Norfolk uh, sort of marshlands. 
Um, yeah, that's true. That's true. Um, Lincolnshire uh, type marshlands, Sealand marshlands. You know, I, I, I'm yeah, guessing. We need to get I Vince on for that, don't we? Yeah, yeah. Oh, yes, we do. Yes, we do. Vince Gaffney, yeah, he's an yeah. uh, expert on all of that kind of stuff. Let us move yeah. on. There's quite Indeed. a lot to get through, actually. We must have to uh, diddle along. Uh, diddle? <laughs> oh. <laughs> if you like. Yeah. <laughs> David. Long Meg. We've got to get to Long Meg. Come on. Oh, yeah. I pressed the button. I think. <clears throat> Our below in the Peak District is another fabulous henge. It may be smaller in size than the enormous henges of Avebury and Stanton Drew, but is nonetheless impressive for it. The inner mound stone circle is long fallen, either through centuries of high winds or perhaps religious destruction, but in use all those thousands of years ago, it must have been a wonderful sight. We've been there in better weather. <laughs> that is true. <laughs> <clears throat> Maybe I'll look at put a link to our uh, henge hunt. Yes. <laughs> That is, a, that is a case in point of being gifted with what you're given, you know. Stanton Moor in Derbyshire missed is home to an enemy, enormous no, Bronze Age cemetery, shots. and its focal point of the Nine Ladies Stone Circle stands on what would have been open high ground. The early morning mists seem to give it an even greater mystery, but nine stones, so often we see nine stones. Yes, Sibylla, it is the one. That Near was... Clitheroe in Lancashire, Bleasdale Circle is another mysterious site, but very important for us in our journey. Remember those? You may have fungi. wondered why I'm not travelling much into the east of the country, and Bleasdale is a good illustration of the reason. This small arrangement of concrete cylinders marks the post holes that have been found here, and this is all that can be seen of a much bigger and complicated site which spread into the surrounding field. The geology of Britain has created an almost rockless swathe across much of eastern England, and this meant that here our ancestors had no choice but to use wood to build all their important sites, which have long since rotted away, leaving no visible trace above ground. Imagine what the flat lowlands of England might have looked like, covered in wooden versions of stone circles. How many wood henges and Stanton Drews might there have been waiting to be rediscovered? Mm -hmm. <coughs> the early church often used standing stones to put the fear of God into the hearts of the lowly people of the parish. All over the country you find sites which still bear the names they were given to frighten the would-be sinner. The Merry Maidens, the Nine Maidens, the Hurlers, the Nine Ladies of Stanton Moor, all turned to stone for doing something ungodly on a Sunday. You know, really bad things like dancing or playing a happy tune. And here, even more scary, the devil apparently threw this stone in an attempt to destroy the church and missed. But aside from early superstitions, what do we have here? This is the Rudston monolith. It's the tallest standing stone in Britain, nearly 26 feet tall. And if you apply the rule of thumb for big monoliths, that there's a quarter again in the ground, this stone is between 32 
and 35 feet long, and they brought it from Caton over 10 miles away. Now, obviously, you don't go to that amount of effort without a reason. And here around Rudston may well have been as important to our Bronze Age ancestors as the mighty Stonehenge and Avebury. Only traces remain, but almost invisible in the landscape are the remains of the most enigmatic of prehistoric monuments, the Cursus. Imagine a henge, a circular area surrounded by a ditch with a raised bank on the outside. And then imagine that idea as a straight line. That's the basic structure of a cursus, and they were clearly of immense importance. There are a number to be found across Britain, varying from the shortest example in Northampton, 200 yards long, through the Stonehenge cursus, which is nearly two miles long, to the awesome Dorset cursus, which stretches for six miles. It's 300 feet wide, and the builders shifted an incredible six and a half million cubic feet of chalk in its construction. And I wonder if the processionary pathway of the Tinwald on the Isle of Man is a living example of the same structure. Every July the 5th on Tinwald Day, the world's oldest parliament walks between the raised banks in a procession to the stepped mound at the end. Here, new laws are proclaimed and the people gather to seek justice and air their grievances. Around Rudston, there were at least four Cursus monuments. And it may not be coincidental that this site lies pretty close to halfway up mainland Britain. A national meeting place, perhaps? Theories about the purpose of these huge structures vary greatly, but I favour the slightly controversial idea that they're the precursors to the athletics track. The feature of the raised bank would certainly have given clear views to spectators. And the fact that there are often burials adjacent to them does nothing to negate the theory. Even today, we still play cricket and hold sports days on the field by the church. We're often so wrapped up in the spiritual side of our ancestors, we forget that a fundamental to all species, especially humans, is competition. After all, the Greek Olympics and the Roman arenas didn't spring from nowhere. Evidence? <laughs> Absolutely none. I just wish they'd uncover some chalk lines running the full length of one. Few things to unpack there, <laughs> uh, not least of which... Alison's of... here. Alison's a very, very, very dear friend of mine. Oh, oh terrific. Greetings. Um, um, <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, well, what do we want to say about that? Um, well, We don't think that have... anymore. No, people that have been following us will know that uh, you know our thoughts yeah. on the uh, idea of the yeah. Cursus monuments um, have changed quite radically, uh, and extremely that we're radically. Pursuing particular uh, angles uh, about them, yeah, yeah. And in fact, when you look at uh, Rudston in particular, as yeah. uh, as uh, you know, you, it's it, it, it's not unique, but it's rare in terms of what's left in the landscape that you've got these four Cursus um, monuments that intersect. And uh, and it, if it is to do with driving livestock across the landscape, then you can see how whichever direction you drive them from, you know, what are the seasonal migrations? It doesn't matter where they're coming from. You're going to get them into one of your uh, enclosures. Uh, you know, it's, uh, it's a distinct possibility. Mm. And we didn't know mm. at the time just quite how ubiquitous curses I mustn't call them curses monuments. They're not monuments. Um, we only call them that because it just slips more easily off the tongue than curses. Because yes. it's not curse eye. Um, but it is curses. <laughs> it will we'll have curses, to start call uh, Now, Kenny Brophy yeah. says that, uh, well, he likes to say curses monuments, but, uh, but curses is the plural as well. It's like sheep. You don't say we've got lots of sheeps. It's, a, ah, it's yes. curses. Yeah. Um, but, um, but you know, be that as it may, uh, yes, there's a lot of them. In fact, there's, there's 60, over 60 left in Scotland. Mm. Um, I can't remember how many there are uh, throughout. Uh, I made England. a little film, uh, what was it, 18 months ago, two years ago, 
where I demonstrated just by walking out of my back door, I could be within <laughs> yes, 10 minutes did. walk standing mm. beside the remains of uh, a Neolithic cursus. Not only that, but within miles, uh, if I just look on the map, there were four. And, and, and I truly believe that there's a, another undiscovered cursus that l goes straight across the cursus that's known that's just uh, down the road from me. Um, maybe I'll... Mm. Uh, Maybe I'll put a, a link up there to that little uh, effort. Actually, I think it was part of one of our um, prehistory shows, wasn't it? The little central bit of one of our uh, it, it prehistory was, actually, shows yes, that we you're started right. to do. You're right. Yeah. Um, Chris um, Davis has just commented, walled earthworks run from across the Ohio River in Kentucky all the way to uh, Chillicote, Ohio. Wow. Um, and, uh, yeah, no, it's an interesting thing of the earthworks in the States mm -hmm. because a lot of known to have been ungulate traps <laughs> yeah. um and so this just oh, it's, yeah so, <laughs> thank you chase <laughs> <laughs> uh, stop it carry on cursing yeah. we will <laughs> yeah uh, the other little uh, in bit of inside information on that bit of uh, filming though those were the very last shots, apart from a few pickup shots a few months later. But on that expedition, mm. we'd gone all uh, through, up through Cumbria, through Derbyshire, up through Cumbria, uh, Scotland, Callanish, across Scotland, and up to Orkney. And then we came back down the east side, and the very last bit of filming that we did on that very last. Uh, leg of uh, filming for Standing with Stones was at uh, Rudston Monolith. And I remember yeah. the, being rather glum on, on the journey back from uh, in the dark from Rudston back to home, knowing that that was the last of uh, mm. the filming that we were going to be doing at the time. You know, yeah. We sort of rather got in the groove by that time, thought, uh, oh, well, that, that happened. <laughs> yeah, I know, yeah, I know, I know, I know. Matt's commented that cursus is Latin for course. Yes. Yeah, but it's it's Stukeley's fault. The, the yeah. only reason that we call them cursus is because of William Stukeley, because he yeah. thought that they were chariot racetracks. Yeah. Um, we should invent um, our own word for them and, and uh, pronounce and uh, advertise it strongly, you know, and, and uh, alter the course of, uh, um, yeah, alter people's perceptions because cursus monuments it's it's so important the words you use we're finding yeah. this time and time and time again with the studies <coughs> that we're doing that um mm. words used to describe places uh, place them mm. uh, you know quite outside or fix well, uh, their meaning mm. uh, in our heads and we stop looking anyway enough of that yeah. I'm banging on about it's that. true um Sibyllis Sib just said oh so that was the end no that was the last thing we shot it wasn't the end of no, the film it, it was never end. planned yeah. to be the end of the film we just didn't do it all in order yeah. <laughs> uh, we we uh, yeah we we planned our routes in terms of ease of traveling rather than uh doing the film oh sure yeah yeah yeah, yeah. all right let's move on mm -hmm. There's a common misconception about our Neolithic and Bronze Age ancestors that they always lived around their settlements and never really went very far from home. But you remember way back at the Roll Wright Stones in Oxfordshire, I mentioned the trade routes across Britain. And believe it or not, some of the best evidence we have for the scale of that trade is up there on the top of Langdale Pike in Cumbria. I do 
did go to the top, you know, just mums on drugs. <laughs> <laughs> there we are, up in the cloud. <laughs> This is local stone. It is found in a few other places not far from here. Most of them a lot easier to get to. And you have to wonder why our ancestors chose this remote and inaccessible spot as a center for their axe making industry. The thing is that this stone produced axe heads of such quality that they were highly prized and desired items. How do we know? because axes from this very spot have been found as far afield as Ireland, Scotland, southern England and more than anywhere else way over in the east in Lincolnshire. Some have even been found completely unused in burials and religious sites. The significance of Lincolnshire is that it's a place with little local stone. The people in the east would have needed to buy these. And what price a beautiful axe? A pig? A cow? A pottery urn, a wife. So did people bring their items here to exchange them? Or were the axes carried all over Britain by traders? The truth is, we don't actually know how the trading took place. The important thing is that it did. Better pause there. Uh, but, uh, there's, yeah. there's, a, there's a few things to pick up on. Firstly, hello, Ryan, uh, from Alsace. Well, you're closer to me than anybody else is. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, well, uh, Chris says, what material is this? It's, um, it, it's one of the greenstones, um, a very prized... Uh, in the, <laughs> hang on, can I do this? D uh, bear with me. Yeah, we are talking uh, volcanic tuff, um, are we not? Oh, you've got some. Uh, th this is Langdale stone, and you can just hear how pure that is, can't you? Yeah. I mean, just, uh, they sing. Um, so actually being able to nap these I, I you know i've got more pieces in the living room that i uh, that i i brought home from uh, from that film actually from that day's filming i um brought these back and uh, um i'd like to give them to uh, well maybe james or jeff uh yeah. <laughs> hello if you're watching you know to ask them to nap me something out of uh, out of the stone it's um it's just such amazing quality stone that, uh, you know, I mean, it was said there in the script that they've been found uh, unused in burials. So clearly they were prized items that were, mm. you know, maybe handed down um, in families. Don't know. The point is that we're talking about volcanic tuff here, and uh, the, the Langdale sites are not the only sites from which um, uh, green stone and uh, special stone for making um, uh, axe heads w was taken. But I think it's uh, the Langdale um, green stone is by far the most well known, uh, and within the UK and beyond, within Britain and beyond. Uh, well prized. This stone has travelled. But as has uh, the jadeite um, axe head material um, from the, the Italian Alps, which dates to uh, much earlier. But we're talking about similar mm. types of stone. The point is that they polish well. And mm. watch out for our interview coming very soon with uh, James Dilly. James Dilly, yeah. Flint Napper Extraordinaire, who of course mm -hmm. you know, works with stone as well and has a very particular take on that. In fact, within the interview, he tells us that although uh, a lot of archaeologists um, pay lip service to the idea that these were ceremonial axes, which is why you tend to find them uh, in, in burials unused and all that kind of thing, but he says 
that these were very, very fine practical uh, uh, um, items uh, because polishing them makes them robust and very sharp, sharper than you really think. So mm. that their the ability to polish a surface makes it much more well. The 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 uh, it's easier to polish than flint for a start off. Mm. Uh, twice twice yeah. as, takes less much less time to polish uh, the greenstone axe as it does to polish a flint axe. And polishing of an axe makes it far more, more robust and uh, uh, yeah, less likely I mean, to break. Sibylla could, uh, could, uh, mm -hmm. could echo uh, that. It's yeah. the simple fact that the more you polish something, the more you take out any of the impurities on the irregularities on the surface that could be focus points for vibration you if you polish all that away then vibrations will uh, will run smoothly through the stone uh, so yes uh, yeah that's, that's what james reckons that actually the highly polished stuff uh, they, he thinks that they were just as likely to be tools that were used as anything else you can always yeah. you know if you chip if you chip a, a, a if you've really polished and sharpened an axe, and you chip it, then well, you can sharpen the chip out. <laughs> you yeah. might end up with a slightly smaller axe. The, but the yeah. thing, thing is, we're talking mm. about the creme de la creme of mm. uh, of an implement that works, <laughs> and and of course, once you establish that, it's not beyond the realms of the imagination to think that people collected them without using them because they were of such high value. And each individual item has its own character, uh, its own weight, its own, you know, signature sound if you tap it. So mm -hmm. apart from being wonderful practical implements, they could become collectibles. So in that sense, they, it's not surprising mm -hmm. if you take that on board. It's not surprising that you do find quite a few that mm -hmm. show no signs of, of use. Yeah. I can't answer all these comments. There's too many. We'll be here all night. But uh, well, the, um, the, we need to uh, answer the behind uh, the scenes questions about uh, uh, if there are any about getting up there. It took two days to get up there. Well, it took more than two uh, days. It took four days well, of waiting to get up there, didn't it? It it did, but we well yeah, but we we got up there in. It depends what you mean by that. We got up there in one. Uh, we got oh, up yeah, there sure. and down yeah, in, yes. in one. Did you count out two days to the top. <laughs> yeah, base, base one, game. base two. No. Um, but yeah. Uh, but yeah, we were in the car park for three days waiting for the rain to stop. Um, That's right. Uh, but we made one attempt and did turn back. Yeah, the, we did. That stream because that we crossed was just a torrent. We couldn't get yeah, across it. Was it was completely impassable. Yeah. Uh, we might have braved it under other conditions, but you have to bear in mind that it was just the yeah. two of us carrying rather a lot of money's worth of gear. Gear. And, uh, uh, you know, it's uh, if we'd fallen over in that, it would yeah. not have been funny. But with yeah. the help of a little camper stove and some pot noodle, we did get up and down in one day. We did. <laughs> pot noodle. <laughs> Do you so know what? The, we would what? we wouldn't we would not be pictures of health if we were <laughs> sponsored by our heroes, Pot Needle and Harry <laughs> Would we? <laughs> no, we would not. Oh, I'm thinking forward to Standing with Stones too. Oh. Yeah, I'm gonna have yeah. to lose some weight before that. Let's move on. <laughs> Let's move on. That, we were right up there, right on that. Yeah. In the region all around the Langdale Axe Factory, there are suggestions of a level of wealth similar to the flintlands of Wiltshire. The small Druid Circle of Ulverston, also known as the Druid's Temple on Birkrig Common to the south of Langdale, looks unassuming but is all that remains of a circle which must have been quite beautiful. There used to be an outer circle, now all but invisible. But the circles once stood on a stone pavement and the inner area was cobbled with a bluish stone that wasn't local. It seems that this carefully designed construction with its open views across... I've paused that as it is. Can yeah, you well see, done. folks, that the <laughs> sun is, has just come through that little opening in the clouds? And we, Rupert, neither Rupert or I have seen this before or since. But it's actually mm. bouncing back off the sea and up at a sort of forty-five degree angle. 
Yeah, you I can't look over zoom on the in right. Detail, but you can, but you can uh, uh, probably it, see. It did quite. We just. It was. Uh, it was a choir of angels moment. We. It just. Yeah. Honestly, it, uh, it just completely took our breath away to see this shaft of light come down and literally bounce off the water. Oh, oh God. Mork Morecambe Bay. Morecambe yeah. Bay. If you're wondering where. Yeah. Morecambe Bay was more elegant than yeah. cheap. <laughs> yes. In sharp <laughs> contrast. <laughs> Closer to the axe factory, things were far less subtle. Enormous show sites were built in an overt display of wealth and power. Sunken Kirk to the southwest originally contained 60 stones in its impressive circle, and excavations found that the ground had been completely leveled in preparation for its construction. And to the north, one of my favourite circles in the whole of Britain, Castle Rig near Keswick in the Lake District, stands in a breathtaking setting. Whilst it may just as easily have been an axe market, the abiding impression here is of a vast cathedral where the mountains themselves are a part of the grand design. Moving away from the lakes, to the northeast near Penrith stands another giant amongst stone circles. In fact, Long Meg and her daughters is the sixth largest in the whole of Britain, with an incredible 70 stones still standing. It's possible that, that Long Meg, the tall mm -hmm. outlier, was standing before the circle was built alongside but it's hard to know for sure. There's a lot of debate about inscribed stones, but I do have to wonder if they're not maps. There are three rings here. There's a big one here that you probably can't see in this light, but we have this big circle here, huge circle. There used to be a circle over there and there still is another circle over there. So we have these three circles that maybe illustrate that. If you look at places like Nauth, for example, in Ireland, where some of the engravings are really intricate, but again show shapes that can relate to some of the structures that we see in the landscape. I've spent a certain amount of time with the Coggy Indians who live in the jungles of northern Colombia. And they are the descendants of, and effectively remain to this day, a Neolithic culture. Now at the entrance to one of their cities in the jungles, they have a huge stone that could be 1,000, 1,500 years old, covered with engravings. Now they call it the map stone, and it shows the layout of the city as it spreads into the jungle. And I think when you look at these rings, knowing what we know now about Stanton Drew, about the post holes and these concentric rings of posts, and that more and more post holes are being found at different sites, I do have to wonder, are these rings actually showing that there were concentric rings within this site as well? And that, without fanfare, is actually the last, the, the end of section five of uh, Standing With Stones. Beyond Long Meg, we moved up past Carlisle and into, uh, into Scotland. We did. Twelve apostles. And all. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, uh, yes. Have we ever seen an aerial view of the Serpent Mountain Ohio? Indeed. Yes. Um, yeah. It's, it's, I mean, some of the mounds in America are pretty impressive. I mean, the Philadelphia, it is, the, is it the Philadelphia Mound Society or the Pennsylvania? Mm -hmm. I think it's Philadelphia. One of you will be able to tell me, won't you? Um, yes. Uh, Anything more to say about the great circles, though? Well, I mean, we could, we could make a whole two hour program just about the, uh, 
the Cumbria circles, couldn't we? And uh, the ideas. We really of, could. Uh, how wealth yeah. created by the, the uh, uh, I was going to say, mining of the uh, uh, Langdale Tuff um, created mm. wealth in the area. This is a popular uh, theory that these vast, mm. you know, these wonderful, magnificent circles in these magnificent settings were huge markets. Um, it holds some mm. water. It may be a simplistic uh, interpretation, but uh, it's uh, something that you can't throw out, isn't it? Completely, yeah. Uh, it, and also, they happen to be amongst the earliest of, uh, you know, as far as dating goes, they mm. are amongst the earliest. Castle Rig is it, all, to be one of it, the earliest. It, it's also worth pointing out that uh you know we've talked about this before there's a huge Rick difference Heiko, it's been great to see you thank you so much for being with us um yeah see you next time Take care. Jeff, i'm waving Jeff. in the wrong place yes Jeff. thanks for coming <laughs> 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 okay cool um uh yes the big difference between stone circles and circles of stones and and the thing is that if you look at swinside sunken kirk there hmm. uh that is a circle of stones uh you know it's a pretty much uh it's not an unbroken ring but it is just a massive circle as opposed to some you know very carefully evenly spaced ring of uh you know a given given number of stones you know you can you can say that if you've got a circle of uh, of nine stones or 19 stones which clearly relate to the lunar cycle as opposed to sunken kirk which is which has 60 stones uh, uh you know it's making a ring it's making an enclosure as opposed to marking time uh so yeah not the same not the same at all mm -hmm. um uh, matt asked did they polish the stones up on the sure. hills or drag them down for processing elsewhere i'm thinking about dragging yes they did them. they yeah, yeah, they 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 roughed them out. Uh, so the the normal practice was uh, so if if you're talking about up on the top of Langdale Pike, that they would um, they would rough out uh, you know a, a good sized stone that could be, then be made into an axe, and they would be carried down and uh, and finished elsewhere. We know not where. Mm. Um, mm. Cool. Uh, mm. Well, uh, thus endeth um, this part of um, <laughs> yeah. Standing with Stones. We've got two more to go, and hopefully uh, uh, Rupert's internet <laughs> allowing, we shall uh, yes. we'll be coming up on uh, the following two uh, Thursdays. I have no idea why it keeps happening on a Thursday, but there you go. Uh, hey -ho. Um, uh, any more questions but... about uh, the Isle of Man and uh, the north of England before we say... Uh, uh, Bon nuit and uh, and go our merry ways, folks. Um, <laughs> um, I can't. Mm. Uh, we, we were very privileged, of course, to make a return visit to Long Beg, Long Meg, uh, uh, two summers ago when we did the uh, the tour with our friends from uh, uh, from the US. Uh, and I, it just knocks my socks off every time, Long Meg, how just awesome that circle is. You don't, it's it, ridiculous. It, it, it doesn't thing, come across. Oh, oh, hold on a second. Hold gone. on a second. Don't panic. It just, you know what? Um, I was going to go and get another battery, but I think at this stage of proceedings, it might just be easier for me no. to... Um, uh, change camera what <laughs> oh okay no change camera that's fine if it's easiest um yeah, yeah the, you don't get an impression from the, the the film of just how solid and big and massive each uh one of those stones is at long meg you know long mm. meg herself the tall stone is impressive but the others something they're just <sighs> they are they're vast aren't they yeah 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 uh, and the the size and spread of the circle itself uh, <laughs> is well, hey ho, makes it all worthwhile, doesn't it? Um, anyway, 
Uh, I can't think of anything else to say, except that uh, if you're new to us and you've enjoyed that, do consider joining us on, uh, and uh, <laughs> lots of the other folks in the chat here, uh, are on Patreon and help us support uh, what we do. Uh, links yes. in the description down below. And I think there's also, Dan, there's an option to, for a one-off donation, donation via um, PayPal, um, what is it, the PayPal donation thing. Mm. Uh, tip jar. The tip, tip jar. jar. Yes. Yeah. Yes. You you will help us to be making Standing with Stones too, which is uh, it's, it's underway. Yeah. It's underway. Yeah. <laughs> so with that yeah. said, I think it's uh, time to say bye bye. Thank you as ever for being with us, and mm. thank you for your comments. Thank you for your questions. Uh, look forward to seeing you all again soon. Thank you for playing nicely with each other. Uh, yeah, it's, that's, yes. we're very lucky with the people uh, that we uh, that come and yeah. join us. It seems. And if if you want to, um, you know, you you can message if you've asked a question that's disappeared and you know yeah. we didn't answer you, and you really want to pick up on it, then you know do message us elsewhere in uh, you know on on the channel or or on Patreon, and uh, you know we will answer you. Yeah. Uh, what is the next thing coming up? Oh, uh, before I get, have to watch out for, you know, pertinent to what I was saying about uh, the Langdale Stone, uh, we've got uh, the interview with um, James Dilly uh, coming up. It'll be a few days yet, but, uh, and uh, Patreon folk will get it first. Just saying. Mm. Uh, but what yeah, and, and, and Patreon folk, they, they get a long version too. They, they yeah. get, oh, yes. Yes, they get because they get to ask their own special questions. They do. So there. Yeah. Um, That's it. Anything else, Mr. Soskin? I don't think so. Before I, I end so. this it's, nonsense, it's, it's, let these people go. It's always fun. Uh, yeah, no, thank you for being engaged, folks. Uh, yeah. It's cool. See you the next time. Cheers. Take Bye -bye. good care. See you.